<laughs> All right, friends, I will invite you to join me in prayer this morning. Please pray with me. Holy One, you are and forever will be the God who came down to dwell among us, to truly hunker down in and amidst humanity in flesh and frustration, in hesitation and happiness, in wonder, in worry, in pain and passion. By your own free choice, by your own unconditional and devastating love, you came to us. Emmanuel, God with us. Even though you knew the trials and tribulations, even though you knew our weaknesses and our sins abounding, you came to us. In the face of all the isolation and fear that the world has to offer, you came to us. And so we come to you, asking you to, to come to us again, God with us. Here we are in isolation again. Here we are in fear again. Here we are in need of you <coughs> and even from our homes and safe spaces, here we are in community. Community with one another and community with you. Come dwell among us again, Holy One. Come inhabit our space, our homes, our hearts. Come infuse our hearts, our homes, and our world with your spirit of grace of truth, of love, and above all, of peace. Amen. Friends, we're going to continue with our Lenten readings. Um, our poem this morning, I sent it out. If you are a friend or a member, um, I sent out the email with our our script, I guess you could call it this morning, with all of the prayers and everything typed out. And I realized about five minutes before worship started that I put the wrong poem title on there. Um, so our poem from Anne Weems this morning is actually called The Way to Jerusalem is Cluttered. Uh, the text of the poem is correct. It's just the title that's wrong. So I invite you to hear these words from Anne Weems this morning. The way to Jerusalem is cluttered with bits and pieces of our lives that fly up and cry out, wounding us as we try to keep upon this path that leads to life. Why didn't somebody tell us that it would be so hard? In the midst of the clutter, the children laugh and run after stars. Those of us who are wise will follow, and the children will be the first to kneel in Jerusalem. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 15 and, uh, excuse me, 15 through 17. People were bringing babies to Jesus so that he would bless them. When the disciples saw this, they scolded them. Then Jesus called them to him and said, allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. I assure you that whoever doesn't welcome God's kingdom like a child will never enter it. Please pray with me. God of simplicity and strength, God of clarity and cause, our lives are entirely too full, too full of noise, too full of distractions, too full of worries and fears, too full of half-hearted desires for things that do not bring us joy. Help us to let go of all the clutter, all the chaos, and all the contempt that fills us up. Make us like children again, seeking joy, seeking laughter, seeking trust, seeking love above all else. We empty ourselves out in your presence, asking you to fill us up with the only thing that truly matters, your holy and abiding spirit. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. We'll read chapter 13, the very beginning, verses 1 through 8, and then we're going to skip down to verses 24 through 37. <clears throat> As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. 
Peter, James, John, and Andrew ask him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? What sign will show that these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. In those days, after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then they will see the human one coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. Then he will send the angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth, from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. Learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he's near at the door. I assure you that this generation won't pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. But nobody knows when the day or hour will come, not the angels in heaven and not the sun, only the Father knows. Watch out, stay alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It's as if someone took a trip left the household behind and put the servants in charge, giving each one a job to do, and told the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show up when you weren't expecting and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. Friends, I invite you to pray with me. God, we pray that you would weave these words of yours into our hearts and into our minds and into our lives, into our anxieties, into our worries, into our fears, into our very being. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> We've all heard the stories, right? Or maybe you've even lived the story, that one in which a young child puts on glasses for the first time and is amazed by how much he or she can see. The individual leaves on the trees, the birds or the airplanes flying up in the sky, the words on the signs as mom and dad are driving down the highway. We hear talk of people talk about the shock and the awe of finally experiencing clear vision, a clarity that they didn't even know that they were missing until their eyes were literally clear. And for some people, that new, clearer vision is jubilant and exultant. They let out exclamations of joy, and they smile from ear to ear, and there is laughter and giggles. And sometimes that new and clearer vision is shocking, and it's even overwhelming. Have you seen those videos of people who have spent their whole lives severely colorblind, trying on those special new glasses that allow them to see color? for the first time. They are powerful videos. You cannot watch them and not cry. People old and young, no matter how, what their age, have exclamations of disbelief and weeping, but also laughter and joy. No matter the reaction, it cannot be denied that the clarity of, that comes from vision is a life-altering thing. And so it goes with our scripture reading this morning. Today, Mark gives us two short stories of Jesus bringing sharp, unrelenting, undeniable clarity to the disciples as his odyssey toward Jerusalem and the cross and crucifixion draws to a decisive and life-changing outcome. Now, in the first portion of our scripture, Jesus is speaking of destruction and 
ruin and dire predictions. It's a section that begins with an innocent enough observation from one of the disciples. Jesus and all of the disciples are sitting together on the Mount of Olives, which is uh, just under two miles to the east of uh, the outskirts of Jerusalem. And they're all admiring the beauty and the splendor of the holy city. And one of the disciples said to him, teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. And Jesus' response is grim to say the least. Jesus says to them, do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Now later, a few of the disciples, Peter and James and John and Andrew, to be specific, seek out Jesus looking for further clarification, the when and the how, the signs that will indicate the coming of this end. But if they were looking for reassurance, and a, a brush off easy answer, they came to the wrong place. Jesus's answer is only full of more troubling events and distressing scenes. Deception from false prophets and teachers, wars, earthquakes, famine, in short, suffering. In our text, Jesus says these things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. Jesus actually spends even more time in the chapter in that part that we skipped over, going into more detail about suffering, about suffering in relationships, and about suffering specifically for their faith in Jesus as the Christ. Now, all of these dire predictions that Jesus is speaking culminate in the second part of our reading this morning, where Jesus describes how the human one, which is Mark's code name for the Messiah, will return in clouds with great power and splendor. And underlying all of this apocalyptic speech is Jesus' mandate to his disciples, and by extension to us, to stay alert, to keep awake, to be attentive and vigilant. This is why Jesus is trying to bring clarity to the disciples in the first place, with all these predictions and apocalyptic prophecies, to help them be prepared for the time when Jesus will come again, to give them focus and purpose and mission in the face of the terrible things that Jesus knows are coming just around the corner. Betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Now there are two ways that Jesus decides to illustrate this point of clarity and preparedness for the disciples this morning. First, Jesus talks about the fig tree. This is his encouragement to be attentive to the signs in the same way that you would be attentive to the signs of the changing of the seasons. But to this attentiveness, Jesus adds a pretty hefty caveat. Jesus says, but nobody knows when that day or hour will come, not the angels in heaven and not the Son, only the Father knows. Jesus is encouraging the disciples to strike a balance between watchfulness and unhealthy preoccupation, between passion and obsession. Watch for the signs, but don't ignore the world around you. Yes, watch for the signs, but don't make that, thing, that the only thing you do, because not even the sun knows when he himself will return. Now, Jesus drives this point home with the second illustration that he uses, the household with the master who has gone and left the doorkeeper in charge. Jesus says, therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show up when you weren't expecting and find him sleeping. Jesus is basically warning the disciples, and again, the rest of us by extension, to not get caught unprepared, to not get caught careless and distracted, to not get caught sleeping on the job. Because we do not know when the Messiah will return. Even the Messiah himself does not know that. But when he returns, we should be ready. And we have to name the elephant in the room, in this very empty room with these scriptures this morning and with all of those apocalyptic, apocalyptic scriptures, excuse me. They can sound bleak and stark 
and very doom and gloom. And it can sound like that because, well, they're apocalyptic texts. They speak of the end times by definition. They're supposed to shock and startle and even distress us a bit to shake us from our complacency, especially in this day and age, but especially in the midst of what we are facing today. Pandemic, supply shortages, social distancing, shelter in place orders, economic instability, and some of the most politically divisive times many of us can remember. In the face of all of this, our text this morning can feel particularly uncomfortable. To be completely honest, when I looked at the text early in the week and read what it was and what it said, I went, oof, because it's uncomfortable. And I know that there are end time theories flying around the internet. Theological conspiracy theories, if you will. And hear me clearly this morning, and I can't see your faces, so hear me clearly. I do not think that that is what is happening in our world right now. But it's exactly for that purpose that I want to encourage you to think of this passage not as a, a portent of terrible things to come, but a call to action, a call to mission, a call to spend the time that we have on this earth, however long that time may be, working and speaking and living and loving for the message of the gospel, even and especially when it feels like the world is crumbling around us. Because that is exactly when the world needs to hear that reassurance of God's love and grace the most. So stay alert. Keep the faith, yes, but also share the faith safely and from a distance. Because God knows, friends, that our neighbors, our communities, and our world are in need. Amen. We come to our time of prayer this morning. I've had a number of prayer requests shared with me throughout the week. Uh, Hadley asked that we continue to pray for Sandy and for Linda and for Karen. Or their health. We need to pray for Joanne, who is healing after uh, the surgery that she had last week, or two weeks ago, I believe. Um, Cynthia sent an update. Uh, her family friend Dave, that we have been praying for, had his amputation surgery this past week. It went as well as it could, um, but we want to continue to lift up his recovery and his rehabilitation, um, as well as his wife Charlene as she adjusts her life and their life to this new normal. Um, we wanna to continue to pray for Alyssa as she awaits her ACL surgery. Um, we wanna to continue to pray for Kurt and his illness. We wanna pray for Maddie and for Jen and for Mike. Um, they had to take Maddie for coronavirus tests yesterday and are waiting for results which is a yucky, yucky, yucky waiting time. So we wanna lift them up in prayer this morning. We wanna pray for Melissa's dad, Sean, uh, who is facing surgery to have a brain tumor removed um, in about a week, a week from tomorrow, um, which is another yucky waiting time because they don't know if this tumor is malignant or benign. So we wanna pray for them. And uh, we want to pray for all of our, our teachers and parents in this uh, uncharted time, but we want to pray especially for teachers and parents of special needs children um, who are facing even bigger mountains to climb. So friends, I would invite you to join me in prayer this morning. God of our homes and God of our lives, Reassure us that you are with us. Remind us that you are the God of our days and our nights, 
of our going out and our sheltering in, of our knowing and our distressingly unknown, of our sheltering in and our community wherever and however we find it in these uncommon and incomparable times. Help us to join together in prayer as your community of believers, near and far, in our hearts and our spirits, brothers and sisters in faith, come what may. We pray today for those who are in special need of your health and healing. For Linda, for Sandy, for Karen, for Kurt, for Joanne, for Cynthia's mom and all those whose health circumstances make them more vulnerable in this pandemic. For Cynthia's family friend Dave in his recovery and rehabilitation and for his wife Charlene. We pray for those who are in uncomfortable times of waiting. For Alyssa as she waits to have surgery on her knee. For Sean as he waits for surgery for his brain tumor. For Maddie and for Jen and for Mike as they await COVID test results. Wrap them in your loving arms, God. Give them peace in the midst of worry and anxiety and discomfort and all those things that go along with waiting. Give them things to keep their hands and minds busy as they wait so time will pass quickly. We pray especially for all those who are ill with this coronavirus in our community and our country and around the world. Those who are hospitalized and those who are recovering at home. Be with them in their waiting as well and bring answers swiftly and soon. We pray for those who are performing essential tasks even in the face of this pandemic, healthcare workers and the chaplains in our healthcare facilities. Those who work in grocery stores and supermarkets and all those places that remain open in order to keep our communities fed and provided for. Those working to provide the necessary medical equipment as quickly as possible child care workers who have to walk such a difficult and scary tightrope, teachers and school staff as they work to provide not only an education in a whole new way, but also essential services like meals and mental health. We pray especially for teachers and parents of special needs children as they add this layer of distance learning and isolation from resources to moments and days that are already challenging. Enfold them in your love, in, your, in their moments of frustration and distress and anxiety. Remind them that they are enough. Their love, their actions, their efforts. Give them moments of rest and respite when everything gets just too overwhelming. God, we pray for those who feel vulnerable in this time, vulnerable in their health, physical or mental, vulnerable in their employment, vulnerable in plans that they have made and have had to cancel or postpone, vulnerable in their financial situation, vulnerable in their ability to teach and lead, parent and function, pray and, and be in this time of sheltering in place and keeping distance. And we pray for our leaders, local, national and international as they make moment to moment decisions in this ever changing international situation. We pray for your healing and your wholeness, Holy One. Healing and wholeness of body, healing and wholeness of heart, healing and wholeness of spirit. For God, our world is truly in a time of need like nothing any of us have ever seen. Be with us in the frustrations and the disappointments that come with navigating this difficult time. Be with us in our uncertainty and fear. Give us an attentiveness to your call and your mission in our lives, to those places in the world that need your love and light the most. Embolden us to bring that love and light with us in all that we do and all that we say. God, we lift up all of these prayers and all of the prayers that we name only in the quiet parts of our hearts, and we give them to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I did choose a hymn this morning. Again, I'm not going to sing it for you, um, but I will post a video on our Facebook page. Um, it's a really incredible, beautiful a cappella rendition of the hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour, um, with all nine parts being sung by the same person. Um, the words, I think, spoke especially powerfully to all that we are going through in our world and in our communities this morning. So I will post that on Facebook as soon as we are done. So here, a blessing this morning, friends. Yes, things are uncertain right now. Yes, things are distressing and wholly unfamiliar and feel out of our control. But stay alert. Take heart, because there is still work to do. Go out into this world, even if it's only virtually, with the good news of God's incomparable love and grace in your hearts, on your lips, at your fingertips, because that is what God calls us to do. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.